Whenever you look for news, you may feel forced to choose between partisans in mainstream media and conspiracists in alternative media. That's where the lost debate steps in. I'm Corey Bradford, a progressive political organizer turned TikTok star who also once hosted a Fox News radio show. I'm Ricky Schlatt, a Gen Z New York Post columnist and libertarian fighting to protect free speech. And I'm Ravi Gupta, a former staffer for Obama and school principal who also fought alongside Republicans on charter schools. And we launched The Lost Debate, a podcast and YouTube show for the political eclectics who've lost trust in a polarizing partisan world, but who also reject the disinformation and manipulation in alternative media. Instead of being at each other's throats, we focus on bringing new perspectives to the table in constructive debate that sounds less like crossfire and more like discussions between real people. Check out The Lost Debate on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. To another BritFlix.com podcast. My name's Stuart Wright. Almost forgot my own name there. My name's Stuart Wright, and today's guest is Neil Marshall Stevens. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. My pleasure, my pleasure. And it is my pleasure because as someone who is a even at, even at my vintage, an aspiring um horror screenwriter, and I've read lots of screenwriting books, it always fills me with joy when a screenwriting book comes along that wants to get under the skin of um, horror screenwriting, and that's your your new book, A Sense of Dread, which we're going to do, we're going to look at five particular areas of it. But before we get into that, I mean, you've got, you've got a history going back 40 plus films that you've written and got produced and you've directed and you, you teach writing. Um, what, what, what inspired you? What was the kind of, Nugget, the nugget that first came to mind that thought, no, this 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 book needs writing. What what you know? Because there's a lot of screenwriting books, but there aren't a lot of horror screenwriting books. Is what is, is a short way of saying there aren't. And and of course, I mean, when I started out, there was there were essentially few or none, no books on on writing screenplays. That was many years ago. I think it was there was Laios Egre's book on on screenwriting, and that was about it. And so I, I had to learn as, as I went along first about just writing screenplays in general. And then uh, as, as I moved into writing horror, I was always a big fan of it. But I found that a lot of what I learned, I had to kind of learn as I went along. And uh, I, I became a student, not only of horror movies, but of just what it was that generated that sense of horror both on the screen and in real life. And I, I just accumulated a lot of information. I read about it. And I found that having worked in the business and watched a tremendous number of horror movies that didn't scare me and a certain number of horror movies that did, I began thinking about it in, in a kind of, uh, in a more thoughtful way. And, and, and thought that there was material here for a book. And I met a bunch of other uh, writers and executives who'd uh, written books for uh, Michael Weiss Productions. It was a, book, a company that specialized in, in that kind of book. And they encouraged me to write it. And I thought, well, I've been kicking around for a while. Maybe it's time that I actually put all this stuff down in, in, in print and came up with a proposal and they went for it and I wrote the book. What was the main challenge for you pulling the book together? What were what were the elements that you were keen to keen to explore, but also what was difficult to convey? Because obviously there's a horror can be subjective, can't it, I suppose? On some level there are some things that certain people find scarier than others, but also uh, I think that there are there are universal fears. And that's part of what I was trying to explore. Some you know, for anything that that most people find scary, there are things that, that a certain percentage of people won't. But I think most people find rats scary. Most people find snakes scary. Most people find spiders scary. Most people are afraid of heights and narrow spaces. And, and again, working out what those kind of broad fears are and what, again, 
And I go into this, the distinction between simply things that are scary and this thing that I call the sense of dread, what the difference is between what we might call just fears. Like if you're, if you're walking down the street and somebody points a gun in your face, you're going to be frightened by it. But there's a difference between that and what I've come to call the sense of dread, which is what the name of the book is. And the distinction between scares, scary things, thing where, you know, the distinction, say, between what we, what it, we call thrillers um, and horror movies. Um, just saw that Mission Impossible movie where Tom Cruise is clinging to the outside of that building. Those, that's a thriller. You're not, it's, it's, it's a scary sequence. And, and it is, it, you know, that, that, you know, where he's slipping and sliding and jumping, all that stuff is really scary, but it's not horrifying. And, and horror takes you down a different road. Um, and that's when I get into this whole issue of what the sense of dread actually is. Um, and the, the sense of dread, um, it, that happens when the, those areas that we think of as normal or natural or safe or sacred is suddenly penetrated by something that is unnatural or abnormal or doesn't really belong there. Right. Well, we're going to, we're going to get into this. One. Well, we're going to get into that. We're going, to go, we're going to do your five questions. We'll do, we'll do the five questions, five format, but just as a kind of, just to get, just get a set, just to get to know you for me and the listener, what would be, what do you remember being a, f- a first film that scared you? I can tell you exactly the, 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 the film and the moment that scared me. It's an old Disney film called Johnny Tremaine. There's a moment in, in that film. I, I think this it's a young boy during the time of the American revolution. And he's working with Paul Revere who was a silversmith. And at some point, like the British are coming and they, there's this uh, container of molten silver and it gets spilled onto a table. And Johnny Tremaine is pushed over and he puts his bare hand down into the molten silver and his hand is scalded. And I don't remember. And I'm just a terrifying image, this idea of a bare hand put down into molten silver. And shortly after, later on, his hand has been bandaged. And we don't see this, but they take the bandage off and they react in horror at what they're seeing because apparently his fingers have healed together. And then they have to cut his fingers apart, which again, we don't see. But again, the, the image of that having to happen ingrained itself in my mind the the horrible image of the hand burning and then the fingers growing together and having to be cut apart you tap into something there which which is a a great thing that cinema does is is your you you know what you're about to see but maybe you don't see it but your mind does all the work for you in a funny way it's one of the things that disney actually did better than almost anyone which is to not only do incredibly joyful things, but to also invoke incredibly horrifying things like, like Bambi's mom being killed, which we never see, but it, it, it ingrained itself in the minds of countless children as this image of, of terror and the, the transformation of the queen in, 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 in sleeping in Snow White. Again, it's incredibly horrifying. And the fact that they never pulled away from those scary moments, from the darkness. Um, in um, 101 Dalmatians, where the, they're, they're fleeing from the, the pursuing, from Cruella de Vil, and they're trying to cover up the snowflakes, the, the, their, their feet in the snow by brushing it off with a, with a branch. And I'm thinking, no, you idiots, you're, you're only making it worse. Just get the hell out of there. They're coming after you. They're going to kill you. Uh, it, it just, I mean, I re- so vividly remember this as a kid, uh, the, the incredible terror I had at their being pursued by these, by these guys who wanted to kill and skin these little puppies. Um, it, I mean, I was completely invested in 
not only saving their lives, but in how terrifying it is the prospect of them being killed and skinned. So those are the kinds of, of images that I, I remember. Of, of all the work you've done, what for you is your, is, is if, if people, people listening to this and they wanted to find what you would consider of your own work, the scariest thing you've done for wow. them to go check out. What would you What would you point them at? Wow, that is tough. Um, I, I guess I have a soft spot for the movie I directed called Stitches, An, another movie I wrote that I think is is kind kind of worked out well. It's not perfect. Called uh, Talisman, uh, that I I did for Full Moon, and uh, of course Thirteen Ghosts, which is uh, the movie I did for Dark Castle. Yeah, I I. I wrote a draft of that script uh again uh, uh it seems to have held up quite well a lot of people uh, you know so um i suppose those those movies uh seem to have uh to have worked well i did a bunch of horror comedies for charlie band including head of family and the the creeps and hideous uh not really scary but uh, i i enjoyed writing them and they, they they're quite fun and if people want to watch them they can as well Fast forward to today, then. What was what would you what what's been the last film that that scared you? I'll tell you something. The movie that I remember really vividly scaring the hell out of me is nineteen seventeen, the war film. Yeah, um, not a horror movie, but the venturing out into no man's land, um, the the sequence when they're in the the underground bunker with those incredibly huge rats. And then the whole thing starts to collapse and they have to like push their way through as the, as the bunker is collapsing around them. Unbelievably terrifying. And, and you, you, you'll find that the, the tools of, of creating that sense of fear and dread, a great many non-horror movies make use of those same tools, create those same kinds of emotions. I mean, of course, also, Movies by Ari Aster and, and by Robert Eggers. Uh, Jennifer Kent also is doing some wonderful stuff. Well, look, let's get into uh, let's get into exploring your book then. Now we know a little okay. bit about your tastes and what, what you see as being scary. The book is like, as you say, a sense of dread, getting under the skin of horror. And you've kindly given me kind of five prompts, which using my five-minute format, we're going to cover in five minutes. So when people hear, we'll, we'll, for those that haven't, aren't familiar with this format, we uh, we spend five minutes against the timer, and when the bell goes off, we stop talking about that one and move on to the next one. Just add a little bit of jeopardy and fun and make me a passive-aggressive host. Right, then, let's get down to your five questions, Neil. We'll start with the top. The timer's clicking on. The book's called Sense of Dread. Just what is the sense of dread, and how does it apply to the writing of horror movies? Okay. Um- and I think I jumped the gun a bit, um, but essentially, uh, I like to distinguish between things that are simply scary and uh, what I call the sense of dread. Uh, and uh, one of the examples I, I give is this distinction between, say, uh, finding, uh, uh, confronting a, a tiger in the jungle, which you would, you know, we expect to find tigers in the jungle. And so, of course, it's scary. It's, your, your life is in danger, but it doesn't elicit a sense of horror. You, you have the sense of horror, the sense of dread. If you wake up and you find a rat in your bed or you see a worm squirming underneath your skin because rats don't belong in your bed and worms certainly don't belong underneath your skin. You, you have what's called a sense of dread, that sense of horror. When something that you consider to be safe or sacred or normal um, is intruded upon, is violated by something that is unnatural or supernatural or unknown or forbidden. So the violation of the sacred creates that sense of dread. Um, blasphemy, anything along those lines creates the sense of dread. Yeah. So what you're saying there then is in terms of someone writing then, it's it's less about the fantastical and more about the subverting of what we feel, where we feel safest. Yes, of course. And we have to, you know, 
it, it's very interesting when you look at movies, they, the, the locations we choose, it tends to be places like you know, homes that are invaded, bedrooms, bathrooms, bathtubs. And it's like, of course, there's a certain sexual element to having intrusions in bedrooms or in showers and bathrooms, but it's also those are the places where we we undress and we feel in, in places where we feel safe. We have sexual relations in places where we feel safe. And to have that that realm of safety intruded upon is particularly terrifying. Um, even in however many movies where couples are making out or having sex in cars because car is a sort of surrogate safe space. Mm. Um, and so we, we look to the see where, where do you feel safe? Where do you feel secure? Where is it safe for you to undress Where you know, the home itself and there's the whole subgenre of home invasion. And that goes, that goes way back. I mean, I must admit, I know that I know that like say I'm lay at bed at night and I'm not sleeping. And so so you're listening to the house. All you need to hear is an is an obtuse noise. And suddenly you can be like, is somebody in the house? And then your mind is doing cartwheels. Because yeah, of course. Because yeah. it's dark. That's not a that's not that that's 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 there's an unknown going on there. And um and also you kind you kind of like you say, you you've you're meant to be asleep, and when you sleep you're asleep, you're most vulnerable, aren't you? Absolutely. Um, and even places like, you know, when you're, when you're sick, when you're injured, all of these things, you, you, you want to be vulnerable. And when you're in any situation like that, uh, our, our place, times and station when we're celebrating, when we're, you know, those kinds of things. So things like weddings and, and uh, birthdays, place, all of those things are often attacked, penetrated. And of course, the sense of self itself, you know, when we're taken over, when we're possessed, the same thing. All of those things are sacred, important to us. Those are the sources that are attacked. And I think we're about to go out. Ah. So, so, so just, just, to, just to recap then, so, it, so as much as, so you've got the idea of the the space that's sacred to you. So a bedroom being a being a big one because, like you say, yeah. we undress, we do intimate things, <clears throat> where we where we like to keep the world out, so we can just do what we want inside it, and obviously people to come in there. But also your living room, your guard. I mean, I remember one time, literally just just looking out my back window, washing the washing the pots in the kitchen, and there was a guy stood in my garden. Yeah. Now I live in a terraced house, so I'm two gardens in. So for someone to be in my garden, they've made a lot of effort if they've not gone through my house. Course, yeah. And it was so alien for him to be stood there that it that it got me immediately. But but you also but what was interesting there about what you were saying was you also said that um something that invades you, you know, obviously, so you got all the body hot revenue, which is some little worm that then burrows under your fingernail and is in, then suddenly you're like, Well, what happens next? Where did that go? And right. and if the skin is you've seen it, we've seen it in lots of horror films where something underneath the skin and the skin's like bubbling, it seems to be bubbling because something's working its way through a body is, again, that's, that's, that's literally taking over you, isn't it? Of course. And body, the body, the mind, the soul, people are being possessed. All of those things, that all of the, the things that we think of as most safe, most secure. Got you. My, mind, body, home, family, anything that, intrudes upon that <clears throat> is going to, to set off those that that alarm dread okay well look let's let's get on to question two then so so the first in your book the first fears are you say your first fears are rooted in biology can you talk talk to what those biological based fears are about or what you understand them to be okay uh, I think the, the first uh, the first fear we have um, is what uh, woman called Temple Grandin, uh, who, with whom you may be familiar. She, she spoke uh, about uh, fears that we share with other members of the animal kingdom. Uh, she saw, talked about being a phenomenon called being curiously afraid. <laughs> and she, she talked about this in relation to, to 
cows and what happens if you just like hang a, a yellow coat over a fence, what, how cows respond to it. And they, they kind of, they're nervous, they creep up, they inspect it. And then when they find out it's not doing anything, they go back to eating grass. But we see that phenomenon all the time in horror movies. If you've got like a half open door at the end of a corridor and what do people do? They go look. They go look. <laughs> they go look. And even as we tell them, no, don't go down that corridor. Don't go through that door. But this is, but at the same time, we want them to go look because this is how people react when you have an ambiguous presence in your environment. You can't just ignore it. You have to figure out if, if, you, if it's immediately dangerous, you know exactly what to do. You get the hell out of there. And if it's nothing, you can ignore it. But if it's ambiguous, you have to figure out what it is. Is it nothing? Is something you can ignore? Or is it dangerous? In which case you get the hell out. You have to go and check it out. And that's that state of being curiously afraid. You're scared, but you have to go down the hall and figure out what it is. And so that biological impulse is something that countless movies have explored. Going down the long alley, going down the stairs into the basement, going down the long corridor to the half-open door, you have to do it. And so it's a biological... It's good that you said the, the, like the yellow coat thing with the cows, because obviously they're going, that's, a, that doesn't, that's not normally there. I'll check it out. It's just a yellow coat. Equally, obviously the characters in a, in a horror film, they don't know they're in a horror film. So... So they're what they they because if you can go down a down a corridor and go there's nothing in that room you can relax, and that's basically that's that curious that's what you're talking about isn't it that curiously afraid is that yeah. until I can settle I can't settle and and of course we because they don't know that they're in a horror movie they understand that as soon as they open the door and there's nothing there they don't realize that we've planted something else to catch them as soon as they turn around and that leaves us to the other key element that is biological and that's the startle reflex which again is something that we share with with countless other members of the animal kingdom anyone who's ever had a cat knows how much fun it is to sneak up on the cat and jab it and send it jumping up into the air and we can do that you know you can do that with with people too just sneak up behind them and jab them and send them jumping up in the air and movies have been doing that from time immemorial um uh, you can find examples of it in silent movies, uh, the, the silent Phantom of the Opera when the mask comes off. Um, that's a big jump scare. But since the advent of sound and the, the use of sound sting to reinforce uh, uh, that jump has magnified the effectiveness of the jump scare because we, we automatically jump at a loud noise. And so if you, you, if you united that, that, that kind of loud kind of blat on the soundtrack with a, a visual reveal, you, if, you, if you watch, you'll see that they almost always do that now. They put the, 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 some kind of a loud sting. Either on the, oh, my word. Yeah, no, the sound design is as much scares you as... Uh... It, it, it can be super effective or it can just be kind of... Eh. Um, but it's... Uh, the, the use of, of startle moments, of, mm. of jump scares, is, is again, it reacts, uh, it, it reaches back into our biology. You, you can't not jump. No, it's, it's, it's a funny masochistic thing to do as an audience member, to know you're going to be scared and watch the screen in a, in a dark room with strangers to make you jump. Yeah, and, and everyone will, will jump mm. out of their seats. It's... it's, it's, it's Whoa! Uh, there was there was one other element that you that you mentioned in your notes that you gave me. There was fear and mapping of the brain. Yes, because of the way our, our brains develop, uh, more nerve endings are are given to certain parts of of uh, the brain than others, and that specifically is I mean sort of not too many nerve endings are devoted to the back, for instance, but a lot to the face. Eyes, ear, eyes, nose, mouth, teeth, hands, feet. And so any kind of injury to those parts of, of the body 
we we immediately respond to that. I don't suppose you've seen the film Titan, have you? The new Julia, Julia DeCarno movie. I have not. There's a, there's a sequence in there, and I've seen the film twice. There's a sequence in that film which fits what you're talking about brilliantly because it's just her in a toilet in in a in a, in an airport, and she's decided she's going to disfigure her face so she looks more like a boy. That's what she's doing. So she's hitting her own face into the sink to break her nose and, and affect the cheekbones. And although you don't see anything, going back to your hand in the molten thingy, the fact the intention's there and the foley elevates the impact. So you think you're seeing someone smash their face in on the porcelain. But you really are. Once she does it, once she does it like half measured, and then you realize she's going in for it, you as the audience member, and like I said, I've seen it twice and it worked both times. Knowing it was going to happen didn't make it any easier, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I I, it, I keep remembering the scene. I think it's from um, um, American History X, the breaking of the teeth. Oh, the goodness, oh, the, cur- the curbing. Yeah, yes. yeah. It's just like, <sighs> yeah, it, it's just the it, same thing. It's just so incredibly visceral, horrifying. Mm. Uh, and and again, I, I keep, I remember back to The Exorcist 2, which is a, a thoroughly horrible movie. Yes, I think we can agree on that. There's one moment where um, Richard Burton is steps into some water and there are apparently there are spikes just below the surface and the spikes go up through his foot. And I think, oh, ah, ah, that's really pretty much all I remember from that movie. It's just, you know, it's, but that that one moment is incredibly visceral and, and memorable. And of course, misery with the breaking of the ankles. It's just it's like... So again, we that those terrors, the, the ankles, feet, toes, fingers, eyes, nose, teeth, anything, any kind of injury to those parts of the body, that's that's hardwired into us. Well, look, let's move on to your third one. Move it, moving from biology, it's the psychological fears that you want to talk about next. Okay, so psychological fears are. Um, those include um, our, our instinctive fears, although, again, some of these are, are instinctive. Some of them, um, some question about that. Some of them may, may have been learned very early in life. But those things include uh, stuff like a fear of falling, mm-hmm. um, fear of heights. Um, and, and, of course, uh, that includes... Um, the, the, the fear of scurrying things. So rodents and uh, snakes and spiders. And it's interesting. We have a particular, uh, and this does seem to be inborn in us, a particular fear of spiders as opposed to other insects. Um, I mean, mosquitoes have killed far more people mm. than, than spiders. But our fear of spiders in particular seems to be extremely... Um, it's my, it's my, that's my wife's phobia. Yeah. Hi, I'm Flo from Progressive. Being a baseball fanatic like me can be stressful. It's not all sports points and touchdowns. So Progressive is going to help you take your mind off your team for a moment. Instead of thinking about how they missed that goal point score, think about the name your price tool from Progressive letting you choose coverage options based on your budget. Unlike your team that missed the end zone net area. Well, anyway, hope this distraction about Progressive's Name Your Price tool was helpful. It sure kept me from thinking about all those penalty balls. Yay, sports! Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. The, the, whether it's the number of late, who knows exactly why. My, by the way, by the way, Neil, my, my, uh, fo- my, fo- my instinctive fear is dogs. That's interesting. Um, and there are a lot, of pe- a lot of people are afraid of dogs. A lot of people are afraid of dogs. And uh, a great many people are afraid of thunder and lightning. That's a very broadly held fear. Doesn't bother me or my son at all. But some people are just go scurrying at the sound of thunder. And, and, and these, are, these are very broad fears, not universal, but, but you find them in a lot of people. Um, and all of these things are, uh, they're available to us as writers to make use of. Um, it's, and again, it's important to understand how you utilize those fears. Because again, 
the best use of all of these things is how you connect them to what would otherwise be normal and conventional state of affairs. You're making me think of like Indiana Jones and, and revealing his fear of snakes. You know, it's like yeah. he has to do something, but to do some to do the thing he's got to yeah. do, he has to tolerate the thing he's most scared of. Yeah. And and it, it's interesting. There, there, are, there are kind of two approaches, which is sort of the unnatural comes into the natural world, or else a kind of conventional identifiable person goes into the world of the unnatural. An example, I, I keep thinking, you're familiar with a, a movie called Willard? No. It was first made in the 70s with a, a star of a fellow named, I believe is a fellow named John Willard. John Willard? I could be wrong. Uh, is, a, is a very uh, kind of boy, boyish actor, very kind of uh, that kind of a lead. And he lived in a suburban home and he found some rats in the basement, his dad, friendless kind of bullied kind of guy in an office and he started breeding the rats in his basement until he had, I don't know, and his kind of hen pecked mom, you know, kind of picked on him upstairs, but downstairs he was like the king of all these rats and they were his friends and what have you. And ultimately he invoked these rats to carry out his revenge. But the, what worked about it is it was just this nice little suburban tract home in this nice little neighborhood. And he worked in this little insurance office or what have you. And then in the midst of it was this kind of little kind of guy and all of these rats. <laughs> but then they remade it. And instead of this kind of nice guy, it was this creepy little guy in this big creepy house with this creepy mom. And it didn't work because everything was creepy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and it just it it took away from it. Um, and you want that that contrast because the the intrusion of the unnatural into the the normal and natural is is what's is what makes it work. Because thinking of like you know the, the 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 classic of where where somebody's using your fear against you. Um, yeah. and, and I mean, it got made, it got adapted into a film, but the classic, the classic George Orwell book, 1984 yep. and the, um, room 101, which is where you'll be confronted with your fears. And funny enough, it's rats, isn't it? In, uh, in, 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 yeah. In, yeah. in 1984 and that idea of you having as your, your punishment in the room is to be faced with your biggest fear. And they know, and, and, the, and obviously the horror of the state knowing what your biggest fear is. So. If it was fluffy pillows, it'd have fluffy pillows waiting for you. Um, you know, it doesn't have to, it doesn't isn't always like horrible in the in the in the obvious sense. For a while I've been keeping track of all of the uh I'm a big fan of giant monster movies. I'm keeping track of all the movies in which uh giant monsters of various kinds look in through the window uh, at at women who are kind of either sleeping or getting undressed or going about their their business. Um and again, this this sense of not only voyeurism, but of, of just extraordinary vulnerability on the part of uh, you know on the one on the one side of the window is just this kind of normal environment, someone going about you know, a woman going about her business, and just on the other side of this sheet of glass is this gigantic horror peering in. Um, and it kind of originally, of course, goes all the way back to King Kong. If you've seen the uncut version of Kong, what the original one? The original, uh, the original Kong. Not seen, not seen the uncut one. No. Oh, you have not seen. Well, prior to Kong staring, you know, grabbing Fei Ray, mm -hmm. there's an earlier moment where he looks in at some other woman who's asleep in her bed. Oh wow, really? And mistakes her for for Fei Ray. And reaches in and plucks her out of her sleeping bed, and is is like examining her as she as she dangles upside down in her in his hand as she screams, realizes it's not her, and just lets her go. And she plummets, you know, through you know twenty stories. That was cut out of the nineteen thirty three version from when it's thirty five release. It's ultimately been restored. But it's 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 just truly a night. Just it's the 
stuff of which nightmares are made. Just imagine someone just being sleeping in her bed and all of a sudden a gigantic hand pulls her out of bed and just, just drops her to her doom. Indeed. Now, look, we've got next section. You're going to move into my favorite, my favorite aspects of horror. These are these that they're that, that you talk about fears that are based in culture. And uh, how did how do these differ from what would what we've talked about so far? And how do they change over time? Um, well, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I talk a bit about um, paranoid fears and what uh, I've always found interesting when you you chart the way paranoid fears change over time. They are very much connected to the power structures of a particular time and to it and to what the the culture as a whole deems to be valuable and deems to be uh, um, values and fears so when um, the you know religious institutions were most powerful the paranoid fears uh, and and schizophrenia and whatever t- schizophrenic uh, delusions tended to focus on delusions of possession being possessed by satan being possessed by demons as the culture tended to move toward more secular concerns you tended to you know those delusions tended to move toward being uh, spied on by the cia having implants in your brain and the government was listening in toward ufo delusions that's that space aliens were listening in all of those things again people who had schizophrenia people who had mental delusions were were acting as a kind of receptor to the the cultural in, inputs mm. what is it that that the, the the world at large was concerned about what is it that people were afraid of what is it that they were people are afraid of the government spying on them in, in the minds of schizophrenics, that turns into a reality. Um, and, and that's always, that's something that we as, as writers can, uh, can click into. Um, and of course, I mean, one of the, they say that one of the things that, that inspired more uh, reports of uh, demonic possession than anything else was the release of The Exorcist. People watched that movie and it so affected them that 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 it connected to their own sense of being possessed. I'm not a religious person, so and I saw it obviously years after. I'm not. I wasn't old enough to see it when it came out, so I could never experience it in in its in its pomp, as it were. But seeing it at a later date, when sort of out of that that high, that that context it didn't have this it didn't have the same power i mean in the con- in the film and the characters you know you believe they're scared and you believe what they're scared of um and you and you believe what's happening but the idea of fear based on your belief system it, it was always hard to connect so I was, I was thinking when you were talking about times and conspiracies and the way people change like i i recently watched close encounters of the third kind which which Richard Dreyfus is very much a hero. But I think if you were to remake that today, the kind of UFO nut would be a proper off the wall, off the rails conspiracy nut job and would be, I think would be the bad guy and he wouldn't be celebrated and there'd be nothing heroic about what he was doing. But it's interesting that, you know, obviously there was, there was a kind of different kind of naivety towards space exploration and what's out there. Of course. And of course, in a weird sort of way, it kind of depends on whether there are really UFOs. In the same way of how we respond to beliefs about demonic possession kind of depends on whether they're really demons possessing people, which, uh, of course, I don't believe in UFOs and I don't believe that demons are possessing people. I have a get out of jail card on that one for my own that, that perpetuates my own fears is that I don't believe in God. But I keep enough in balance that makes me scared of the idea that there's a dark force of some description. So I'm I'm right for horror films, <laughs> um, as, as am I. And, and uh, <laughs> I, I I've written movies with with demonic possessions. I have I I fully embrace what what the idea of demonic possession embrace. You know, bodies or what space aliens embody. They're obviously reflective. Of, of deep cultural concerns 
And it's just, it's just as, as demons and space aliens and all the rest, they're, they're, they, 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 they are expressions of any given society's ideas about power and, and the unknown and the uncontrollable and the means by which we can address those things and potentially gain some kind of understanding and control over them. Again, it, it all relates to, uh, in, in the same way that we try to understand mental illness, we try to understand the uh, bad happenings and, and find some way to propitiate them or to deal with them whether it used to be by burning witches or by conducting rituals, we find different ways of doing it now. I like, I like, I like it where, I mean, Midsummer's a good example, where, where the old and the new clash. So like things that have been forgotten and then somebody from the present day is confronted with something they never imagined that existed. I love that kind of culture clash that creates horror. Well, look, sir, let's, uh, let's get into our final section, which is... Um, which is the toolbox of dread, which is about how do we on the page create these scary moments to make us get that sense of dread overall, to to tap into those fears of the unknown, to get to get to start get to, to to tickle the startle reflex so we make people jump, to uh, to 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 sort of tap it, you know, find those instinctive fears that we that we either have ourselves or at least we believe the characters possess. Okay, well, what I, first thing that I, I tell people is that. Um, Whatever the emotion may be, whether it's it's dread or joy <clears throat> or tension, nothing ever just happens on the page. Um, the same way that you have to build to a laugh, for instance, um, you have to build to uh, to a scare. Um, and there are tools that you can build, you can use for that. Uh, for instance. You want to um, build tension by ratcheting. Um, uh, you use what's called, you, you use tension and tension and release. Um, characters um, who are unable to uh, express an emotion and cannot express an emotion and cannot express an emotion and cannot express an emotion and, express an emotion and then are able to express it. So a character, uh, one of, there are a whole bunch of movies where characters can't talk, or can't make a sound, a um, whole bunch of them. And of course, all of those movies are about characters who essentially are put in a position where they want to scream, want to cry out. And because of the nature of the situation, they're not able to. And because they can't, we want to. And those, those kinds of scenes, in the same token, uh, one of the Mission Impossible movies had Tom Cruise diving into the water. And he has to hold his breath while, all this, while he's doing this. All those kinds of scenes. Because, of course, when he's holding his breath, you know that everyone in the audience is struggling to hold their breath as well. What about the use of mis misdirection and reversal? Like how 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 much can you get away with not giving the scare? You know, not you you can. I mean, the point about misdirection is you use a, an early scare. Um. So, and and I'm I'm sure you've seen this a dozen times, where, for instance, you have that walk up a stair, walk down a hall. And then something happens, you're, you know, you're confronted by a mirror or you bump into something or something that's like, ah, brief scare. But that's just something along the way. You've just, you've just misdirected somebody and it, the, the, the sequence keeps growing and keeps growing and keeps growing. Um, I, I direct people to um, the scene in The Conjuring, um, the the clap scene where, where uh, she starts at the top and she kind of goes down. There's the bang as the, as the pictures fall down, misdirect. She goes down the stairs, goes around, 
goes down the stairs. And again, it's a series of misdirects, you know, just the, these, these moments that they're jump scares, but they're all just, they're just building along the way to that final clap when she's trapped in the stairs. But even then, it takes us back upstairs to the scene with the, the daughter in, the, in her room with the, the, the demon. The, so it, it's just one thing, just you know, one jump leads you to another, leads you to another, leads you to another. So it's, it's just continually ratchets up. When you are creating them on the page, is it, I guess is it a, it's, more, it's more of a trial and error than it is about recipe, the recipe to do it. Well, it, it, I mean, obviously there is no recipe because it's always very specific. But the point is, and the point I was trying to make before, is that jump scares on the page are a big challenge because in reality, the loud noise or the sudden change is scary when you watch it, but not scary on the page, not scary when you describe it. So you can't, you can write it down, but the, if a scene or a movie relies just on jump scares, it, it's like it's like writing a comedy that relies on pratfalls, which are kind of the comedy version of jump scares. It's like, it's funny when you see it because of the surprise, but it's not, it's not funny when you describe a pratfall. It, I mean, you 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 understand in reading it that it's it's supposed to be scary, or that it might be. It's going to be scary when you when you see it. I mean, I te- I mean, on the page, I don't know what 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 it might look like, but I know I what I try what I tend to do with at least surprises, not always just jump scares. You might use words like suddenly a yada yeah. yada yada, or without warning. Yeah, a thing, of course, a thing. Yeah. Falls, it, so, you yeah. can signal it, can't you, on the page with the words you choose to use? And, and there are there are variations on that. You can use suddenly or suddenly. You know what? What do you what do you mean by explicit versus non explicit horror? What I'm talking about is something like um, the the day like Dawn of the Dead is very, is very much explicit horror. The the original Hellraiser is very explicit horror, and you can you can certainly do it, but. You, I mean, what I always thought is interesting about um, Dawn of the Dead, I, when I, I saw it when it first came out in the theaters, you have to be, if you're going to watch it, you have to be sure to get the uncut version because there's, there's, a, a, there's an edited version and it, the opening, it looks really crummy because they've, they've cut out the violence, and done some other stuff, and it looks really cheesy than the cut version. If you look at the uncut version, um, it, it's really quite remarkable and much more remarkable if you if you saw it when it was first released, when it came out in American X-rated version, X-rated for violence at the time, is that opening is it was really just like nothing you'd ever seen before when it first came out. It's just incredibly brutal. But you know, people, you know, the dead were taking big bites out of people's arms and heads were being blown off. You just you'd never seen anything like it. But after that opening, after like that first seven or eight minutes. They never, you know, Romero never put anything so at that violent on the screen again. But you were so shocked, um, and and put off, you know, and just turned upside down emotionally by that opening, that you just had the feeling that anything might have ha- might happen again. Anything that was the that was the thought process that that put you on edge so much by that by those violent images that you you just had the sense that you were now in this world where just anything might happen to anyone which i think plays i mean that's it's a it's actually a good thing i mean it's something a note that i get a lot myself uh, or i've had a lot sorry that idea and and you're talking about the cold opening aren't you which kind of in a way allows a film to breathe after it's happened because then everyone knows they're in a horror film don't they it's like that opening you're describing in dawn of the dead it's like it's like yeah we're in a horror film now Whatever happens next is is linked to that thing that you've just hit me over the head with. But of course, if you just keep on doing it, I think at a certain point you, um, th- there's a, a law of diminishing returns. Yeah, well, well yeah, because like Donald, using Donald Dead as an example, by the end of it, the real fear for you is the hopelessness of of being trapped like that, not the idea of getting eaten and your guts spilling out. 
It's the idea this is it. You know, weirdly, we you know, we were talking before we started recording about the state of the pandemic. And in some senses, we've proved, if nothing else, society's proved during a pandemic where there isn't any walking dead, that if there was walking dead, we'd be rubbish. Yes. Too many people would just not believe that they were walking dead. It's, they're, they're fine. It's just, they're, you know. What do you mean by isolation versus dislocation in terms of for a writer's toolbox? I think isolation and, and dislocation, I think, are, I mean, in a sense, they're, they're similar things. It's the notion that you, you want to um, take characters out of their normal situation. Um, it, it, when you, you take someone emotionally out of, out of their normal comfort zone, mm-hmm. you, you create a, an, a, a sense of dread and of fear. So it's always something that's that's useful to you as as you're writing. You start start in some place that is uh, safe and normal, and then push them into some place that is uh, without without assistance, without help. It's illustrated. If you t- if you take me now, sat in my office, I'm as comfortable as I am. I'm here every day. This is this is where I come. I go and do do my time. But if suddenly, while I'm while I'm sat talking to you now, having a Zoom call, if this is a scene in a film that's a horror film, and then my phone screen just cracks for no apparent reason, you that suddenly is like, there's a clue. What's going on there? Suddenly, my safe office is now got an unexplicable event. <laughs> I've got to work that out. And then while I'm looking at, looking at the phone incredulously, the window just crashes in on my face. You know, suddenly that safe office is no longer a safe office anymore, is it? Yeah. I mean, I think what what I've always said is, I mean, I live in Brooklyn in New York City, and I said, if if this morning the water stopped working and the lights went out, a couple of days from now, this would this would just be a, a, a desert of, of of starving, desperate people. It's just like we would be, you know, we'd we'd be we'd be in hell. Um, it's just we're 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 that far away from the jungle, um, so it's just. The, the the fragility of everything that we come we've come to um, uh, we've come to trust. I mean, I re- I remember my my uh, son was taking a bus uh, home from I think well from from college, which is Boston. Yeah, and the, the, his, his, at some point the bus just stopped in the middle of the highway at night, and the bus driver just took the gas can, got out of the bus, and just walked away. Just left them on the highway in the middle of nowhere. Apparently, they'd run out of gas. And he went to, he went to walk back. He, as it turned out, he went to walk back to, to get some gas for the bus. Oh, but it's man. like he didn't, expl- he didn't explain anything to anyone. He just left them. Do you just know what? My, 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 my horror mind was doing cartwheels then, as you described, because I was thinking, A, where is he going? And and then B, I was going. Who's he left? Who's going to pick those people up? Because it's like the idea that he's just dropped people off for a sacrifice was my yeah. was my immediate yeah. thought. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, I and I I got the thought. I was like, gee, I wonder what would happen if that was like in the in the middle of the desert somewhere, and you know, it just <laughs> I guess gone. It's gone somewhere. Uh, so it's the same thing. Dislocation, isolation. Those are those are all tools that you can use to create that sense of dread, because we're wherever we are in the world we're never we're never really all that far from being isolated from being dislocated i mean i've always had this thought uh, i i lived once in an apartment building that was next to another apartment building mm. and there was a, a very narrow space between the two i mean maybe not even 12 inches across i mean obviously that was how that it, it wasn't designed there was some they built one building and they built another building with this very narrow space between them. And I thought, gee, I wonder what would happen if somebody accidentally fell in between that narrow space and got stuck there. It would be very easy for no one to even notice them, no one to hear them. They would, you know, that would, <laughs> that'd be it. <laughs> I need, there's one yeah. thing I have, to, I have to talk to you about before we, before we sign off. Is it was nice of you to personalise the book for me. Um, when I was reading through the uh, the script sample sections, you have a character who's who shares my surname. 
you have right all the way through it. And I was like, just it was hilarious for me to be. I'm often put off when I just say the name Stuart in a character, but the idea I kept seeing my surname all the way through the script writing examples of stuff you've done and and how you how you do the horror. And I should say, in the, the book, the book is a the book covers a lot of what what we've been talking about in 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 a, in a more sort of practical way for you to sort of come to, to come to grips with it. But also, what's great about your book, and obviously it's about screenwriting, is that it's full of examples of screenwriting and and showing how it works, not just not just the theory of fear, but also the the theory and the practice of putting words on the page to to try and create that sense of fear and dread. Um, so I, 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 I just just so people are clear about what it is that we're talking about with your book, uh, which is a sense of dread getting under the skin of horror screenwriting. And it just gives me, Neil, to say thank you very much for giving us your time on the Bitfits podcast. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs>